Hi and welcome to a third episode of new or hidden blueprint features you will find interesting. So in this episode I think we're gonna have a few good ones but first we're gonna start with an easy one which is format text. So let's say you want to print something and maybe you have a variable let's name it bool and you want to print it in here with some text usually we do append and we can do something like this bool variable we can do space and then you need of course the next line so you can put in your variable usually there is a conversion for it and that's about it now there is a bit nicer way especially for more complex stuff where you would need multiple of these rows to do each separate thing so maybe we have let's say int where something and now you need maybe space like this and then we can do maybe like that and we can put this thing in here and now if we print you can see how it shows so it can get a bit more complicated and messy so what we're gonna do is use format text so let's type format text connect it in here and now what we can do is type in here let's say boulevard and we can use special brackets here to expose a variable so if i type something like this you're gonna see now we have this bool exposed as a wildcard so technically we do not have to have a boolean here you can have whatever you want but we also name the variables we kind of know what needs to go in there and we can do something like this and now i can have them in here connected and it gets way nicer way cleaner and we get basically the same thing we had in here so we print and we get the same thing new rows and we print the both variables so i think that's kind of about it for format text and now let's go into something more complicated so the second thing that you might find interesting is async physics stick so if i open it up in here we can see i have some setup in here just to showcase what happens with it so let's say you already have this async physics stick enabled and i connect it in here and what we are basically doing is just adding five centimeter offset every time this stick and after two seconds we just pause the game so we can kind of see what's happening in here also we're gonna force 120 fps and let's press play and you can see our box is moving and it moves over here now let's change our fps to 30 you just want to move this box in consistent time so if you set the frame rate to 30 and press play you can see we have the same results it kind of came to the dot box and if you go back to 120 press play we can see it came to the similar spot basically now that is expected behavior but now let's try this with a normal tick this tick ticks every time you render a frame meaning that if your frame rate changes that's why we have this execute console command to change your max frame rate if your frame rate changes also your offset is going to change so now we're going to do 120 fps let's press play it's a little bit different than the physics tick but that's fine now let's change this to 30 and now you can see how it's drastically different as i said before what's happening here is that this tick is frame rate dependent meaning it's variable so whatever is our current frame rate that's how frequently this function is going to be called which is going to give us issues if you're creating some custom physics thing or we want a consistent update and stuff like that now physics tick we can define in our project settings type pacing and we can see in here how we have fixed time step size meaning that whatever our frame rate is we're always going to tick in this situation 120 times a second so that means that we can consistently get the same result so it's more deterministic than our normal tick so if you ever want to do your own custom physics or you need consistent ticks you can use async physics tick and to enable it uh, you need to go to class default type async and then async physics tick enabled here and also you're going to have to go to your project settings and then do tick physics async and for for me the default value here was 0.033333 whatever which is basically 30 frames a second and i just increased it in here so you can see the difference of what's happening also this option is not available in some earlier versions of unreal i forgot exactly when it came in unreal but i think i'm not sure if it was exposed to blueprints in 5.4 or 5.5 but you couldn't use it in some other versions so you'd have to find alternative solutions or expose it in c++ stuff like that so depending on which unreal version you use you might not see it in here when you type async physics stick now the third feature you might find interesting is tear off function so in here i have a simple setup where when the game starts we ask dedicated server to after two seconds tear off now what tear off means 
is to detach this actor from replication so now the client and the server do not talk each other anymore when it comes to this specific actor now you can use it on anything you don't have to use it on the character and if you ever want to see network options in blueprints you can type network here and you have this networking tab and you can see a bunch of stuff in here you can force net update check a bunch of stuff like is that the guest server which we're using here and then we're also using this tear off function so to kind of shock is what's happening with this is I have this event tick and the server is just going to update the actor's offset and by default it's uh, replicated for the character. So when I press play or actually I first need to set it to play as client, press play, we can see how it's updating and it's just going to go indefinitely because we are not staring it off right now. You can see at the bottom how we did not connect it. So we're just going to indefinitely move a little bit to the right. Now I'm going to enable the Terra function. Let's press play. Now you're going to see after two seconds we stop and now we are moving around but keep in mind that this is client only basically because we are now separated from the server. So server and client are not talking anymore. Now let's go to another kind of simple one but might be interesting for you to check out if you never use it which is if I right click here we can do is packaged for distribution so this function can get useful points where let's say there is some stuff that you only want to have when you are in the editor or you're in a debug build or a development build and you don't want to have something in the package project so something that is actually going to be distributed to the users what you can do is use this function and basically say hey whatever is packaged for distribution is going to go in here and then whatever I want editor only I can do it basically in here so guys convenient thing I just wanted to mention it here the last thing that we're going to talk about are bit masks and this is kind of a complicated topic but you might find it interesting so I wanted to mention it here and basically what bit masking is is that you can have an integer and you're going to see this option which is bit mask and when you enable it you're going to have normally you would have uh, flags up to 32 flags and you can also select to be bitmask enum, so you can create any enum and just select it in here and you're going to have a list of uh, stuff in here. And basically what bitmasking is, is you can use your integer, just this singular integer, basically like an enum, I can say, hey, this integer has these two enums that are enabled or disabled, I can pick which one are enabled or disabled. And how it works in the background is basically... It jumps, it doubles for every enum, so you can have all of the variation of the enums. This is kind of how I understand it. So this enum one, if I, for example, enable only test one here, and let's disconnect some stuff here and just take enum test. Actually, we can just connect it here. So right now it looks a bit complicated what I'm doing here, but uh, I'm just connecting int test to print, and we're just printing int test. And if I press play, we can see how it says one. So that basically means that this integer is one and one represents only, it basically means like the first enum is enabled. So if I then enable test two, it should not test uh, say two at the top left. And if we do test three and press play, we can say it says four. So one double from one is two, then double from two is four. And then it, we're gonna go to eight, 16, 32, stuff like that. And that's the reason why when we look at here, it has up to 32 flags, because when you double, you get to the end of the length of the integer, basically. Let's go back to the test enum. And now the interesting thing, so we said one is one, then two is two, then three is four. And what we could do is enable two of them. And now this integer is going to show combination of them. So one plus two, so we get three. Now, if I enable all three of them, what we get is one plus two is three, three plus four is seven. So if I press play is seven. So you can see how each number can then represent a combination of these integers. For example, one and three is one plus four, which is five. I can press play. So five is now a unique number representing basically a first and third enum, if that makes sense. Now, it might be hard to kind of figure out what's happening. You cannot have a huge switch where it says, is it number one? What is number one? Is it number two? Stuff like that. So what you can use is bitwise operations and you have and, not, or, and XOR. And they're not intuitive to how they work. So you're going to have to read around to figure out what's happening with them. But let's say now we want to print this, which is and. And what this does is, let's say we have test one and test two enabled here. And we have this one disabled. If I press play here, it's going to show zero. So now why is it showing zero? The reason for that is that it's basically saying I could not find three in your list of enums here. But if I do two, I can press play and we can get number two here. So what that basically means is it found two on number two, basically. So it exposes what's happening there. And you can also do combinations. So if you do test one and test two, you can then press play and we get number three. So saying both of them are found and you can kind of do stuff in there also. Then you have the or bitwise. If I connect it in here, 
and let's say I want test 3 here and our int is of course test 1 and test 2. If I press play we are gonna get number 7 meaning we added test 3 to our test 1 and 2 and for example if I have just test 1 and test 3 we should get 5 here. And what you can use this for is basically to combine them and set a new integer, for example, in here. So what you basically use this one for is to add a new thing in here and this one more to read and see if the enum or groups of enums exist. So this is kind of what bit masking, basically you're figuring out what individual bit means and what you want to set to toggle individual bits, stuff like that. So if you do this now, we are kind of adding test three to our list. So maybe our character, you can imagine maybe this is our character stats. Maybe this is, I don't know, bleeding poisoned burning and now what you're basically saying is if you're bleeding now we want to add burning to your status effects or something like that it is kind of a nice way to have a really compact memory compact way to hold enums instead of having a bunch of different lists and stuff like that and if you ever want to read more about it there is this bitmaps blueprint variables on epic games documentation and you can see kind of the general setup and some basic stuff to get to understand how bitmaps work we try to use to figure it out and see a nice way to use them. Now, for Unreal generally, you probably don't have to worry about for memory to this extent, and also I'm not sure about the performance, but that's generally it about bitmasks. We went through formatting text, async physics stick, Terra function, bitmask, and package for distribution. Hopefully you found this uh, interesting, and if you have any interesting features in blueprints that you think would be nice to mention in the future, I'll leave them in the comments, and I might add them in the future episodes. But yeah, that's about it. Mm -hmm.